Reporting changes pursuant to notice I call up H.R. 2833, the Pretrial Release Reporting Act, for purposes of markup and move the committee reported favorably to the House. The clerk will report the bill. H.R. 2833. Without objection, the bill will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Fitzgerald, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On November 5th, 2021, Daryl Brooks Jr. was arrested and charged with felony reckless endangerment after running his girlfriend over with his car in a gas station parking lot. On November 16, 2021, Mr. Brooks was released from the custody of the Milwaukee County Sheriff's Office on a $1,000 bond. Five days later, on November 21st, 2021, Darrell Brooks drove his SUV through the annual Waukesha Christmas Parade, injuring over 50 individuals and killing six, including an eight-year-old child. I wish that case that cases like these were rare, but unfortunately, Mr. Chairman, we're seeing them all too frequently. That's because liberal cities and rogue state prosecutors are seeking to limit or altogether abolish the use of cash bail. For example, after New York passed its bail reform law, recidivism rates increased for individuals who had previously violent felony offenses. A March 2023 study by researchers at John Jay College of Criminal Justice found that approximately 72% of violent felony offenders who were released without bail were rearrested. Similarly, in January 2023, the state of Illinois began implementing its, quote, safety law, which stripped judges of their ability to set cash bail and require prosecutors to provide evidence within 48 hours that provide the offender committed a crime that posed a, quote, significant threat to public safety, unquote. While it's still uh, too early to know the full impact of this law, counties across the state, such as McHenry County, are already reporting an increase in those charged with subsequent felony offenses. Meanwhile, the city of Chicago was awarded more than 2.6 million in burn JAG grants in 2023 to support Illinois reckless bail policies. The Bureau of Justice Statistics which is tasked with collecting, analyzing, and publishing information on crime, criminal offenders, and the operation of our justice system at all levels of government, have previously reported pretrial release of felony defendants in state courts through its National Pretrial Reporting Program, or NPRP. The most recent NPRP report is from 2007, so it's rather dated, but it is, uh, eval it, it did evaluate pretrial release statistics between 1990 and 1994. I think we can all agree it's time we received updated reported data. Uh, that's why I introduced H.R. 2533, the Pretrial Release Reporting Act, which would task the Bureau of Justice Statistics to report on individuals charged with violent felony offenses who are subsequently released on bail or obtain pretrial release. I hope my colleagues on the other side of the aisle would agree that this data would be helpful informing Congress of how state and local prosecutorial decisions are impacting the safety of their communities and would hopefully prevent future tragedies like the one that occurred in Waukesha. I urge a yes vote on this bill and I yield the uh, balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Georgia for an opening statement is recognized. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, masquerading as a purportedly harmless reporting bill, H.R. 2833 is actually just another baseless attempt by my Republican colleagues to engage in fear mongering about crime despite historic drops in violent crime in cities across the country. Their target this time is bail reform. The premise underlying this bill that bail reform in cities with so-called so progressive prosecutors has created a dramatic ongoing increase in violent crime is simply not true, it's wrong. As if that, were, if, as if that weren't bad enough in trying to justify their false premise the bill requires but does not fund a report that would be simply impossible to complete, certainly not within the 180 days given, uh, much less every year thereafter. Let's start with the supposed justification for this bill. It rests 
on the outdated and completely disproven notion that violent crime is on the rise and that bail reform is somehow to blame. But this simply is not true. With the onset of the pandemic, increases in crime were felt in communities of all sizes, political alignments, and demographics, and in states that enacted bail reform policies, and just as much or more in states that did not. And murder rates have been higher in red states than in blue states in every year in this century. More importantly, the statistics conclusively show that violent crime has been falling dramatically for more than two years under the Biden administration, even in states that changed the way they look at bail and pretrial release. Although the majority would like to pretend otherwise, Crime rates began to drop in 2022, while 2023 featured one of the lowest crime rates in more than 50 years. And crime rates continue to fall even further in 2024. Despite what our Republican colleagues want Americans to believe, the evidence fails to show any causal connection between bail reform and crime. However, cash bail has resulted in a dramatic rise in the number of defendants who are detained pending trial, resulting in tremendous financial and social costs to defendants, their families, their communities, and taxpayers who bear the cost of incarcerating nearly 450,000 people each year who have yet to be convicted of a crime. It's not surprising that the burdens of pretrial detention fall disproportionately on communities of color and on women as well. As a result of the growing body of research demonstrating the ineffectiveness and inequities of the cash bail or fixed bail system, a number of states and local jurisdictions have made efforts to reform their bail practices in recent years and the data show that bail reform has not led to an increase in crime or recidivism rates. In the state of New York, which instituted bail reform at the beginning of 2020, fixed bail is still used for violent felonies, but for misdemeanors and nonviolent felonies, defendants are released on their own recognizance or under individualized tailored conditions designed to ensure their appearance in court. Three separate studies have shown that while crime rates in New York did increase in 2020, as they did throughout the country, bail reform was not a driver of that increase. One study found that elim eliminating bail for misdemeanors and nonviolent felonies in New York actually reduced rearrest rates. And of course, in New York, as in the rest of the country, crime has been declining precipitously. The other fundamental problem with this bill is that it imposes an onerous reporting requirement that the Bureau of Justice Statistics, or BJS, will not be able to meet. The bill would require BJS to obtain data from all state courts in the country without defining that term and without recognizing that much of the data that the bill would require BJS to collect is not housed in one central location. To truly fulfill this mandate, BJS would have to go to courts as well as jails and multiple pretrial service agencies in every single jurisdiction in the country to collect the data. This would be nearly impossible without a massive infusion of resources that this bill does not provide. And such a report is not necessary because it is entirely duplicative as recognized in the findings of this bill, BJS awarded a grant of $2 million to the Research Triangle Institute in 2020 to conduct a study of pretrial release through the National Pretrial Reporting Program, which BJS first initiated in 1988. Although the study was slowed down for years by the pandemic, it is still underway and BJS anticipates that it will be completed by the end of this year. Rather than imposing an impossible annual burden on BJS without appropriating a single dollar to fund that burden, 
we should wait for the completion of this ongoing work. Of course, if my colleagues across the aisle really wanted to address violent crime, they could invest in community violence intervention, fully fund the ATF, enact common sense gun legislation, and provide targeted support to law enforcement. Democrats have consistently supported such efforts while Republicans have repeatedly blocked and tried to defund them. Although I am typically inclined to support reporting bills, as are many of my colleagues, I simply cannot support this legislation. Rather than gathering new data and useful data, it creates an unfunded mandate with, with which BJS cannot possibly comply to launch a misguided attack on bail reform. It's disappointing that Republicans would rather demagogue on the issue of crime than work with Democrats on solutions that would truly make our community safer. With that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back without objection. All of the opening statements will be included in the record. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Wisconsin for the purpose of offering an amendment in the nature of a substitute. Uh, yeah, Mr. Chairman, I do have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment in the nature of a substitute. Without to objection, the amendment in the nature of a substitute we consider as read and shall be considered base text for the purpose of the amendment. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Wisconsin to explain the amendment. Well, Mr. Chairman, as I mentioned in my earlier remarks, the last report that was produced by the National Pretrial Reporting Program it does rely on uh, data that's over 20 years old. So uh, we should not be relying on the outdated statistics to guide the committee's uh, oversight of the federal funds, uh, like the, the burn jag, which I talked about earlier. So this amendment uh, is in the nature of a substitute would make uh, to report annual, uh, giving Congress up-to-date statistics on how state and local prosecutorial Decisions are impacting the safety of our communities. Uh, this is really the only substantial change, but I, I do believe uh, that it would respond to some of the uh, concerns that I heard from the other side of the aisle. So I urge the adoption of the amendment, the nature of substitute, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from, gentleman, gentleman lady from California, and I'll come to the gentleman from Maryland. Uh, I move to strike the last word. Gentleman lady's recognized. I just want to um, first thank Mr. Johnson for his um, very cogent remarks. I think he uh, laid out quite accurately the statistics, potentially the motive for the bill. Um, really, there is uh, there's no there there. Um, but I, I, I thought it was important to note that the Bureau of Justice Statistics is actually going to complete their report on this very subject by the end of this year. And so uh, this bill is completely unnecessary. Um, I would note also that there was um, some analysis done uh, by the department, uh, an advisory that uh, went through some issues that I think uh, that this bill uh, does not accommodate. For example, the uh, to collect the information relevant to pretrial release decisions, you need more data than is generally available. Uh, for example, how do you distinguish between uh, pretrial release, release programs uh, and those that are uh, released because of limited budget or by court order for jail overcrowding or versus pretrial risk assessment? That information just can't be uh, collected. And unfortunately, this bill uh, has the same problem. I, you know, honestly, since this bill is never going to become law, um, you know, I don't think it matters whether we vote yes or no. Um, I certainly want to get the information that we will get by the end of this year from the Bureau of Justice Statistics. Uh, certainly every Democrat on this committee is looking forward to getting that accurate data by the end of this year. And so um, I, I really, it's disappointing that this bill is being considered today. Perhaps the committee was not aware of the deadline that has been promised and the new information that we will have by the end of this calendar year. So um, I, you know, maybe I'll vote for this bill. It really doesn't matter whether you vote yes or no, uh, because this bill is never going to become law, and actually the information is going to become known to this committee and the world 
by the end of the year by uh, the Department of Justice. So I just wanted to note that and also to once again uh, thank Mr. Johnson for outlining the, the facts, which is the, the various scare rhetoric about uh, crime is really misplaced. Crime is, is falling across the United States, uh, and there is uh, some of the uh, overheated rhetoric around the country is really misplaced and an effort, I think, to alarm people. Obviously, there is some level of crime in every community, in every country, and, and we are not uh, immune from that. Uh, but to spin that unfortunate fact into an emergency uh, that is beyond background is inappropriate and I think not a service to the public that should be uh, not scared beyond the facts and the truth. Uh, so with that, I, I just wanted to lay that out that we will have this information uh, by the end of this year. It will be accurate information and uh, this bill is completely unnecessary. And I don't know if Mr. Johnson has additional comments or Mr. Uh, Ivy, the gentleman from Maryland, I'd be happy to yield. Uh, I'd yield to Mr. Johnson. Thank you. I would, uh, Madam Chair, thank you for, uh, 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 Madam Lofgren, thank you for yielding. I would uh, like for the record to ask for unanimous consent uh, to enter the following documents. One is a 2013 report of the National Pretrial Reporting Program, which demonstrates that contrary to what is stated in this bill, the last NPR report was not in 2007. And also uh, documents submitted by the Bureau of Justice Statistics to the Office of Management and Budget in support of BJS's information collection requests for the currently ongoing National Pretrial Reporting Program study. Without objection. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Maryland is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, I share the concerns that have been raised already. I just wanted to point out a few more uh, as we go forward. I, I, the, the point that was made earlier about a study that is due, I, this may be what's referenced ironically on page two of the um, of the, the the bill, which references 2020, the National Pretrial Reporting Program um, of the Bureau of Justice Statistics awarded a grant of two million dollars. So that that may be what the report that's forthcoming. Um, it's a little ironic that you know we're going to have a legislation that's going to require the use of that money to do what's already in the pipeline to get done. And there ought to be some kind of coordination with respect to that, uh, because these are heavy unfunded mandates. I, I, you know, I was the local prosecutor in Prince George's County, which is just under a million people. And so we have a sizable apparatus there. Um, and you know, the Maryland state courts have a pretty large apparatus, too, as far as data collection. But I don't think it, even we get that granular. And I would think that there'd be many states um, local prosecutors' offices, lo local police officers, uh, police departments, uh, and states that just don't have the apparatus in place to correct, to collect all of this this information, without getting s significant funding to do it. Um, you know, and and so I think we should, if we're going to request this information at this scale, especially with what I think is a an impossible turnaround of 180 days. This is a very massive request for data. Uh, turning that around in six months, I think, is unrealistic. Um, and if we are going to really seek to do that, I think we should probably um, try and figure out what kind of funding would be needed. My thought would also be to reach out to state and local law enforcement and ask them what they might need to try and produce this kind of information. Are they able to do it under, you know, which states, which, which counties, which jurisdictions are able to produce it, uh, you know, in their current circumstances? Which ones are going to need help? Because if they're going to need help, um, I think it's incumbent on us to help provide it if it's information that we want to get. And then, you know, with, with respect to the drafting of this, um, and this, this isn't uncommon in these kinds of criminal provisions, um, but I don't see this reference to other provisions that have tried to address this issue. So, and that goes to the issue that states define particular offenses in different ways. And so, you know, 
rape or attempted rape, um, you know, in some states, they don't use those terms. They have sexual assault. I see sexual abuse there, but some states don't define it in that way. In fact, the abuse term is frequently used for child abuse, which isn't mentioned in here, I don't think, as one of the things we would want to track. But from my perspective, child abuse, especially violent child abuse, would certainly be one of the, the things we'd want to know about and track for these kinds of things because if you have a serial child abuser um, and we're trying to figure out whether these people are getting pretrial release or you know, breaks on detention or not that's inappropriate, isn't that the kind of information we'd want? I, I would think so. Um, resisting or obstructing an officer is another one. Uh, sure, let's track that, but different states define it different ways. And some of them would say, like, rather than a resisting or obstructing an officer, assaulting an officer, especially if it's a violent assault, which might not be captured, depending on the state you're in, by resisting or obstructing. I think under the federal law, as a matter of fact, resisting or obstructing is different uh, statutorily than assaulting a police officer. But again, I think assault, we would want to know if people are assaulting police officers and they're getting out, uh, you know, faster than they should or they're not getting bail, whatever that is, definitely the type of information I would think that we'd want to know and, and collect under these sorts of circumstances. Recklessly endangering safety. I mean, I, I don't know for sure what that means, but that's another one of those types of provisions. I mean, Maryland's got reckless endangerment. Is that what's included here? Could be a scenario where it's violent, could be a scenario where it's not. But, you know, the Bail Reform Act, uh, for example, which touches on, I think, the issues you're trying to get at here, at least at the federal level, has gone through the process of, going, of, of making these definitions uh, applicable and giving guidance on how to apply them. It would seem to me that we'd want to tap into that so that we don't run into the same problems that they had and, and try and reinvent the wheel. So, you know, oh, and the term violent, by the way, is also another one that needs to be defined. For example, some... Some provisions say drug dealing is a violent offense. So I, I would say if we want to do this, and I, I, you know, collecting data I think is, is useful and important, I wouldn't necessarily oppose it. But let's not reinvent the wheel. Let's try and do it in a way that uh, is going to work uh, and doesn't impose unfair mandates and unfunded mandates on state and local uh, law enforcement. I'm, that I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Wisconsin is recognized. Um, I'm, I'm sensitive to some of the comments that were just made. I, I, I guess what I would first say is uh, I'd love to work, and we have been working with members of the Senate to develop uh, a strategy that's going to result in something more than what BJS has been working on since 2020. They spent about $3 million already and have really, uh, we have no idea what's going to be uh, turned out at the end of the year. So that, that would be my, my first response. The second is, I, you know, I didn't dream up this bill. This came from prosecutors. It came from those involved in law enforcement who right now are saying there's such a patchwork, not just in the 72 counties within my state of Wisconsin, on the difference between what's being prosecuted and the types of crimes that are being prosecuted, or those that are being, uh, you know, at the end of the day, kind of dismissed as, as not serious crimes. I mean, they're asking for consistency. And, and they need a national strategy. Um, and I'm not a big proponent of that all the time, but I think they're asking for a national strategy on coming up with this data versus kind of a patchwork. And, you know, I, I think that's why the bill uh, certainly, you know, could be, uh, you know, there could be changes made. Um, I'm not necessarily hung up on some of the definitions that uh, Congressman Viney just brought up. I, I think, you know, the same thing. I think there is there is uh, some wiggle room on some of that stuff as well. But the point is we need to get something going now because what we're seeing is that this is absolutely hampering prosecutors' abilities and, and public defenders throughout the nation to try and understand what is going out there on the street and, and how should they be dealing with those situations. So I think there's no better time to bring this bill forward, not just because of some of the recent high profile incidents that have happened nationwide on this, this front that you could characterize as, well, there's an inconsistency, you know, that's simply as, as fine as the county line, you know? 
it, it doesn't make much sense right now. That's why I think the report makes sense. And quite honestly, I'm not looking for anything of great substance that's gonna come out at the end of the year, unfortunately, with a lot of money that's been spent and, uh, and with, you know, three years down the tubes. So well, would, would I would the yield gentleman, back. Would the gentleman yields back. I, I'll, I'll claim time and yield to the gentleman from Maryland. I, I would just say this, and you know, we've, we're working together on legislation. Um, I think in good faith and, and trying to figure out not this particular provision, but you know, if the gentleman, if you'd want to withdraw it, or you know, we could try and work together and, and figure out how to how to fix it and move it forward. I'd be more than happy to try and work with you on that. And also, I mean, I, I share you. I don't know what we're going to get out of the bill, or out of the report that's being done. And I, I think uh, Mr. Johnson pointed out that there was a huge overlap with respect to COVID. It would have a would have a huge impact and distortion effect on on this report during those years. But I'd be more than happy to work with the gentleman to try and figure it out because I think this is information that could be useful if we go about getting it in the right way. And with that, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I yield back to you. Gentleman yields back. Uh, I yield back. The question uh, the question occurs on the um, amendment in the nature of a substitute. On adoption of the amendment nature of substitute, this will be followed immediately by a vote on reporting the bill. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment in the nature of a substitute is adopted. Reporting, a reporting quorum being present, the question is now on favorably reporting the bill as amended. All those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. No. The ayes have it, and the bill is ordered to be reported favorably to the House. Members will have two days to submit views. I'd request a recorded vote. A recorded vote is requested by the uh, gentleman from Georgia. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Jordan. Maryland, excuse me, I'm sorry. 